Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Doctor is In series. This is episode 201. Finally broke that 200 number. It's a big milestone for us. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since 2009. In this series, I am co-hosted with the doctor of The Doctor is In, Dr. Abby Morano. Nice to have you here, Abby. Thank you for having me, Chris. I'm Dr. Abby Morono. I'm a behavioral scientist and the director of education at Social Engineer. I'm a nonverbal communication coach and expert and a professor of psychology. I have a PhD in behavioral analysis and psychology, and I specialize in nonverbal communication, trust, and the psychological mechanisms underpinning decision making. And you got your PhD right, which is, which is an improvement. I mean, you, you know, usually you say it's like a PhD in nuclear nonverbals and astro psychology or something like that. Well, I do now. You always get it wrong. And now I can't remember what I have a PhD in. <laughs> but she really does have a PhD, people. It's real. Okay. It's real. I mean, I've seen the paperwork and that we, we printed it from online. So I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know I've messed her up so much. It's terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, before we get to our exciting topic, here's a, a few announcements. Do you use CentOS uh, 7 servers? Well, if you do, you might be wondering what you're going to do because coming up soon, they're about to hit end of life. So you're either going to be migrating or having to get a whole new distribution. But you don't have to worry about it if you're using TuxCare. Uh, TuxCare offers its customers ongoing vulnerability patches for CentOS 7 and many other end of life distros. They even will support end of life languages like Python and PHP. So if you're using CentOS 6, 7, or 8, or Oracle Linux 6, Ubuntu 16.04, or Ubuntu 18.04, or other systems that are end of life, then you need to go to T-U-X-C-A-R-E.com. That's TuxCare.com. And check out the services they offer. Really amazing group over there. They're big fans of this podcast and also sponsoring this month's episodes. So we're really happy to have them. Also, if you're looking for anything to do with the social engineering end of the world, please check out social-engineer.com. If your company is dealing with any of the big problems in the world of hacking, let's use vishing as a main example because we are hearing so many reports daily of companies who are dealing with attacks over your phone system. So if your people and call centers or even your everyday employees are getting fraudulent phone calls that are trying to get them to transfer money, give over credentials, passwords, uh, click two-factor authentication links, anything of that sort, and you're wondering, how can we stay protected? You should go over to social-engineer.com and check out the services that we offer because we can help your people learn how to mitigate, defend, and fight against those type of attacks. And for those of you asking about our training, I'm really excited about our training path, which is now all new on the website. So uh, we're revamping the website too, so that will be out shortly after this podcast is out. But you can check out our training offerings. There's an APSE class in Orlando coming up in July. There's one in Europe uh, that will be launched, and I want to say Romania, but don't don't hate me if that changes, okay? But that's going to be in September, and then we have a brand new class. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using APSE, and we even changed the names. I'm getting it wrong, right? So it's the foundational application of social engineering, which used to be APSE, and then the practical application of social engineering, which is a class where you do live phishing and vishing on actual real-life targets. Uh, that class is getting launched in June, so you'll see that on the website. And we have a brand new class, which I'm not sure if it's going to be on the site yet, so I'm just going to tease you with it, but Abby's writing a class all about the psychology of social engineering. So you can check out all of our new offerings on the website and see what's coming up and when they'll be available, and we'll be excited to have you in class. If you love the topic of social engineering, you should definitely join our Slack channel. I think there's like 1,500 people in there now. Every day they're talking about different aspects of SE, uh, whether it's pretexting because they do it for a living or they're uh, in the education side. So they're looking for help and teaching their people how to be aware. Uh, we even have a job board where about 10 people have found employment because companies come in and post jobs that they have. And many people have gotten hired through that. So if you're interested in a legal, family friendly chat about social engineering, you can join us with the link in the show notes. And if you can't find it, feel free to ping either Abby or I on on Twitter or LinkedIn, and we'll get you that link. I want to also invite everyone who's listening to stop over at innocentlivesfoundation.org. If you're not familiar with our mission at Innocent Lives, uh, we work with law enforcement very closely to help monitor, find, and geolocate people who are trafficking children 
and who are creating child abuse material. Um, we're not a vigilante group. So that's why we work closely with law enforcement. And our mission and goal is to help uh, get those people apprehended and save kids from the harm that exists because of these things that are happening to them in the world. If you want to support us, you can do that through many ways. You can volunteer for the organization. We always have needs for uh, people who can do OSINT type of work, or even if you want to support us in other ways, uh, like financially, we're a nonprofit, so we can use the help financially with your donations. You can find out all the different things that you can do for us at innocentlivesfoundation.org. And last but not least, if you like the music of this podcast, of course you do. I mean, who doesn't? Everyone loves Clutch. It's like they're the best band on the planet Earth. So you should go and check them out at pro-rock.com. Neil's a part of ILF, and the whole band supports us. Actually, if you go to the Spotify link for Clutch, there's a little donate button, and they did a really nice thing by having all of those proceeds go over to ILF. So check them out. Give them some love and uh, help us uh, thank them for all the things they do for us, not only the podcast, but also for ILF. Okay, Abby, what is our amazing topic that you have chosen for us today? Our topic today is going to be a fun one. It is the illusion of rational thinking. The illusion. Okay, that, even mm-hmm. the top, even the the theme sounds really mm-hmm. interesting. So let let's start off with define that. What do you mean by illusion of rational thinking? You're saying that no one has rational thinking. So the classical idea in economics and behavioral economics is that human beings are rational. We assume (laughs) that we can understand and assess a situation and then come to a rational decision as to what the appropriate behavior might be and that we make rational choices that maximize an outcome. Um, And that isn't necessarily correct. Um, We don't always use the information available and process it accurately to make a rational decision. Mm. And as behavioral economics has moved forward, this classical idea that human beings are rational has been vastly challenged. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense because uh, when you were kind of defining it, what I was thinking is, yeah, I know myself, like I make a lot of decisions based on how I feel about something. And Mm -hmm. if I'm overtired or if I'm uh, had too much coffee, I know that my decisions will be altered based on just the the mood I'm in or how I feel for that day. Uh, That has nothing to do with logic or rational, rational thinking at all. Yeah, that's actually a great point that we'll get into later, because usually people will say they don't act so much on their feelings. They consider Mm -hmm. their feelings, but they take in all of the information and we make this accurate judgment of what to do. Um, And the most reasonable and rational choice based on that information, which most of us just don't do, it is very cognitively demanding to do so. We've talked about loads in previous podcasts about how we take mental shortcuts. If we were constantly assessing every situation accurately, imagine how much information we would need to take in and process to then logically decide the most appropriate outcome. So how do you accomplish rational thinking then? Or is that really, is the, the theme of this podcast really the, the the reality, which is that it just doesn't exist? Yeah, so the, the theme is the reality. We're going to talk about, well, why is rational thinking an illusion? Um, and there's some great examples of this. And I thought the best one to start with is just a very simple one that I think everybody can relate to. And it's the topic of framing, mm-hmm. how we frame a question will change the outcome of that question. So if I say to you, um, would you, uh, there's a great example um, of this. And there was a a study done and they said um, there was say six people on a train track. And if the train went left, um, four people would be saved. But if the train went right, then two people would die. Which way would you move the train? Hmm. And people will go, obviously, with the one where the people are saved. But if you change the framing and say, well, two people are saved versus four will die, they won't go that way. Um, They like to go for the option that is framed as a positive. Mm. Um, If you frame something as a game, people are more likely to go for it than if you frame it as a loss, even if the outcome is identical, regardless of how it's framed. Yeah, I, I like that that point because it's um, one of the things that I learned in traveling uh, is just the difference between like the UK where you're from and here in America, just the sale of something like meat, right? Mm-hmm. That um, that over in the UK, you yeah. guys sell meat by the quantity of fat that's in it, 
But that became a very bad way to sell things here in America. So we have to sell it by the lean percentage. Yeah. So over here, we'll have 80% lean where you will have 20% fat in your meat. And it's the same exact thing. But I remember being the first time in the UK and seeing that and going, whoa, that's terrible. This meat is like, there's so much fat in this meat, right? And then I'm like, wait, yeah. it's the same thing I'm buying at home. Like, what the heck? You know, it's just framed differently. And that's by, based on the culture that it was being sold in. Absolutely. And that is a great example. And there's so many examples of that in the literature where they change the product and they do it a lot with things like yogurt um, and change it from what percentage is fat and what percentage is not fat. Completely identical, yeah. but it changes how likely people are to buy that product. And even if you know the effect is there, yeah. it still has an effect. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, I think that's part of uh, what I love about um, our discussions and just understanding the way that we think and make decisions. Being knowledgeable of it doesn't mean I walk into the store and I'm like, oh, I know you're tricking me. I'm not buying that meat. Yeah. I know it's happening, but I'm actually almost sometimes glad that they're catering to the things I want to, you know, I mean, sometimes it stinks when you buy something, and you're like, well, I thought this was going to be good quality and it's not because you fell for that. But, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it, it shows, it shows, some logic behind marketing when they cater to the audience that they're trying to sell to. Yeah. And even just having the awareness, it can help you in some situations avoid doing it. So if you know that framing something negatively, for example, in negotiations, there's been work that if you frame a question negatively, it increases risk taking of the partner mm. and you don't want them to take risks. You want them to cooperate with you. Um, and it's much harder to reach an agreement between negotiators when things are framed negatively. Mm. And so they found that there's more, when there's more of a positive frame, it's much easier to have this cooperation between negotiators. So when you know that, you can think about how you are framing questions as well. Yeah. And that's a really good point, I think. And uh, even if like, let's take it out of negotiation and just say everyday life with your family, right? So let's say, you're, you know, mm -hmm. your friends, you have to talk about something and maybe it's not the greatest topic. You know, there was an argument or a disagreement thinking before you go into that conversation on how you frame your initial introduction or your, your intro into that conversation could literally change the whole tone of that. And I know I'm guilty of that, you know, like, especially if you're angry or you're upset, it's really hard to get that. Uh, I was going to say rational thinking, but now we're saying it's wrong. But isn't that funny? I was going to actually say to get rational thinking going. Mm -hmm. But when you're angry, it's really hard to get that critical or logical thinking going because I'm being run by emotion. But how much more important it seems at that moment to give that a little more thought so you are saying things framed properly. Absolutely. Um, and just going on from that in terms of, say, let's go back to sales, because I think this research really sits so nicely in sales because we make so many of our purchase decisions based on irrational thinking and a, a great example is the cost of zero <laughs> and anything that is put as free might actually cost us to make an expensive choice because we're like oh well it's free so if it's free there's absolutely no downside and then well of course that's just a rational way to think but actually, we may pay too much for something, say, in time, mm. if it's free. And it feels good to buy things that are free. Um, <laughs> and there was a, a great original study on this, that they had Hershey's Kisses and Lint Chocolate. And anybody who likes chocolate will agree that <laughs> Lint is superior. Than like Hershey. a thousand percent. Yeah. And it doesn't contain lead and other bad things. Yes. <laughs> well, this is not a sale for Lynch Talk. No. <laughs> but if, if you would like to sponsor us. Any, then that's fine. <laughs> yes, Lint, if you're listening and you want to sponsor the Social Engineer Podcast, we'd be more than happy to eat your chocolates during the podcast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just saying. Not sure that the listeners would enjoy that. <sighs> they might. I mean, we're just but covered in chocolate, you know. <laughs> Really good. <laughs> Chocolate in our teeth, you know. It's a different kind of podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back Okay, to sorry, back back to uh, Hershey and Lint. <laughs> yes. So they had the Hershey's kisses and the lint and um, chocolate on the table and they had the price. And the lint was fifteen cents and the kiss was one cent. And seventy three percent of people chose the lint. They <laughs> then moved them both down by one cent. So the lint was 14 cent, which is a, a great deal. And then the kiss was free. 69% of people chose the kiss. 
even though they clearly preferred the lint, it's just now because it's free. And when something is free, we think, well, there's no downside. You know, I'm always going to choose the free option because I'm not losing Mm. anything. Well, actually, you're probably losing a bit of enjoyment having that. Did you really actually want that chocolate? You just had it because it was free. You know, that's a that's a fascinating study because um, in the beginning, hearing the 15 cents and one cents, I would have guessed people would have went like if I had not if we did not read it and we were just talking about it. And I guess I would have said, oh, they would have went for the kiss because it's so much cheaper. Right. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that it proves that, yeah, people knew the quality standards and they said, well, even though there's a 14 cent difference, I'm going to pay something out of my pocket. I'm going to pay for the one I really want. But what? Wow! What a turn! I mean, by seventy, you said seventy-three percent was the first one. At seventy-three percent went with lint first. Yeah, and, and then, then sixty-nine. Sixty-nine percent went with ki- uh, the kiss afterwards. So only a four percent difference, but sixty-nine percent went with the inferior product. Yeah, they almost completely swapped places. Yeah, almost identically. Wow. Um, and it's because we're so afraid of losing it. It feels like a loss when we don't take huh. it free, even though we're not losing anything. We're just not gaining anything. Um, yeah. You know, I am a sucker for this when it comes to like the yellow labels on food. The yellow <laughs> labels are when they reduce things uh-huh. and they, they make it so much cheaper. And I, I know what it's doing. It's making me feel like it's scarce that I'm going to lose out. And, you know, if I don't like it, it's not much of a loss. And I will buy things that I don't even eat just because I'm like, what well, you know, it's 50p like what a great deal <laughs> you know um my my wife falls for this all the time uh mm-hmm. there's there's these sales now which is buy one get one free mm-hmm. and it's always of the inferior quality of a product so let's say you have yep. the brand name that we always use and we know we like this one and this is the one that we've bought forever and we know it's quality right so let's just say it's like the lint but then next to it you have one bag that's much <laughs> inferior for the same price as lint but it's buy one get one free it's like, mm-hmm. but I'm going to get two for the same cost. And she comes home with two of them. Now we have two bags of inferior garbage that I don't want to use because <laughs> they're two bags of badness, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. but yeah, I, I could see it. I could see that happening because, you know, I don't have the, the, like, I don't buy things just because they're on sale. But if there is something and both of them are the quality of what I want and there's a sale on one, that definitely motivates me to buy more of it. Yeah. Right. Because there's a sale on it, which is just, and I know what's happening. I'm sitting there and I say to myself, I, I know what I'm about to do. You know, I'm going to spend more money <laughs> on, than I was, than I intended to spend. Yeah. Because I'm getting two of them, but I'm saving like $3 on getting two of them. It's like, wow, oh, darn it. Why? <laughs> yeah. It feels like a loss. Yes. It's almost, you know, we're very loss averse. We mm. don't like losing. So if we feel like something is a loss to us, we're going to go for it. And it's not a loss. It is just not a game. Um, do, you, but, do you think, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, uh, do, do you think that that's a Western cultural thing or is that just humankind across culture? It's a great question. Um, I think it's probably more Western. Um, we are very stuff focused. Mm-hmm. We have so much stuff. We're so afraid of loss. And particularly in cultures which are very money driven mm-hmm. particularly in something like america you know yeah. it's a culture that is very time it's money so everything that is a potential cost is very costly um particularly yeah. in the consumer market when we talk about buying products in more collectivist cultures and i assume that it probably still stands just not as greatly It'd be something i'd like to look into yeah it's an interesting topic because you know i think of things like um Like when I was younger, I always changed my own oil, always mowed my own yard. You know, anything that that could be done by me, I did it because it it felt like I was saving money. And as I got older and busier, I realized that, well, for me to stop working, you know, where we can maybe make X amount of dollars per hour for me to do work, if I'm going to go mow my yard, but I could pay someone, you know, $100 a week to go do that, I'm going to make more in the hour it would take me to go do that. So there's a savings, you know? So I argue with myself and go, I'll just pay someone else to do it. And it, you know, after it feels like so weird growing up, like doing it all yourself, but then now you're paying people to basically change my oil, clean my car, you know, mow my yard. Yeah. Yep. In this kind of Western culture, everything really is 
time is money. Yeah. And it does lead us to make these decisions which we think are very economic and very rational. And actually all it is is just very loss averse. And mm. there was um, a research done about how it feels like time is running out now. And we all think that we have less time now than we used to have. Mm. But actually, because of convenience, we have so much more time than we did. It just feels like we don't because the pressure that we put on ourselves to get everything done. And I, I do think that social media is a big influencer of this, that you see mm. people showing the best parts of their lives and showing this false version of themselves. That it makes us feel like we're not achieving enough or we have to do better. I think it's just pushed this culture forward into making these decisions of everything has to be the optimum outcome for me and if there's a loss that's not an optimum outcome you know it's interesting i was on a, a meeting with joe navarro the other day and he his phone dinged and he looked down and he's like excuse me i gotta i gotta answer this and he had a text and he sent it and then a minute later it did it again he's like i'm sorry i really gotta answer this he goes to me you remember the days when Someone can text you and or, or message you, and it was okay if you didn't answer that mm -hmm. second. And I'm like, I actually do. Like, I'm not that old. I can remember where maybe it was. We didn't even have cell phones, right? And where if you mm -hmm. wanted, if you said, "Hey, call me when you get there," it was literally when I got there. I had to go inside or find a payphone and call you. There was no, "Hey, I'll be there in five minutes." You know, there was none of that. It was when I get there, I get there, and now. It, I, what you just said, it, it made me think of that conversation. It's like immediacy is almost yeah. demanded. Like, it's like, hey, if I text you and you haven't answered, what what are you doing? Like, why are you ignoring me? You know, it's been 13 yeah. nanoseconds. Why have you not replied? <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's like, what do you hate me now? You know, there's the yeah. bad framing of a question. Right. <laughs> it's also, yeah, great framing. <laughs> yeah. Why do you hate me? I mean, I texted you 13 nanoseconds ago. What? Then it's like, why? God, why? Cry emoji. You know, it's all bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's not even just this convenience overload. It's now a choice overload. Too. Mm. And having too many choices is another thing that leads to irrational thinking. Because we think, if we think logically, okay, well, we have a large variety of options. So now I have more of an ability to find the option that suits me. Because there's more to choose from. Mm. However, if people are given a greater amount of options, so the higher the, the option, the higher the likelihood that they're not actually going to make a rational decision. They're more likely to go back to what they're comfortable with. But we would assume the rational choice is as um, the more options goes up, the more likelihood that they're going to find their most ideal purchase goal. We would assume that mm. it's linear because we can search more, we can find. But we have this option overload and because we're not rational it doesn't work in that linear fashion when we have way too much it can cause a lot of stress and we feel like we have to make the most perfect decision and i think a, a great example is when there's loads of choices on a menu Oof. and you think oh well okay well if there's this many choices i can find yeah. something that is most suitable to me what we usually do is go through all of them and then go back to our comfort meal yeah because it's choice overload and you go, I don't know whether to have this or this or this or this. So I'll just stick with this because I can't make the choice. I was thinking of two things <clears throat> when you brought this topic up. So first, um, when we visited my wife's family in Thailand, um, go into a grocery store and you want uh, fruit, there's the fruit section and anything mm -hmm. that is grown in that season is available and that's it. Right. You go over to the sauces or something. And there's like, this is the only fish sauce we sell. You want it? That's what you have to buy. Right. <laughs> so like, there's not 700,000 choices of different yeah. kinds of bottles. And you're sitting there going, I don't even know which one is good. It's like, there's, there's one, you know, so yeah. maybe two, you know, they have this one and this one. Yeah. And one of them's really expensive and one of them's super cheap. And that's it. Right. There's two choices. And I found it. Um, I didn't think of it until way later, but I found it so much less stressful. Like yeah. getting in and out of a store was like, bam. And then, uh, and then, uh, and the second thing I was thinking is we went to, um, uh, Portugal. Uh, we had some work in, uh, Portugal and then we took a little holiday and went around and saw Portugal and we'd go into a restaurant and the lady would come up, no menu. She would say, do you want fish or beef? And I'm like, well, how, how are you making it? She goes, fish or beef? 
Yeah, which one? That's it. That's, that's it. And I'm like, uh, fish. And she's like, okay. And then like three courses would come out around what I picked, but that was it. There was no choice. It was, you want this or this, you know, mm-hmm. and then you want this bottle of wine or this bottle of wine. That's the two we have, you know, and, and it was, yeah. you sit there for three hours eating and talking and having a great time, but you had no stress about 700 page menu trying to figure out what each item was. Yeah. <clears throat> it does. Yeah. Pa- too many choices can paralyze. I, I agree with what you said. Yeah. It seems counterintuitive. Hmm. And there was a, a study done looking at um, people selling jams. Uh, and it's um, they had an assortment of six jams um, comprising of, I think it was like 24 flavors. And when they found when they gave that many flavors and the 24, people didn't want to pick them. They, they struggled to make the choice. When there was too many to pick from, they struggled to Hmm. actually know which one they liked. When there was less, they were more likely to make a purchase. So if you're selling a product and you're like, here's 24 variations of this product, you might be actually limiting your sales Hmm. because you're giving too many choices. If you limit that, and I think the study was uh, they had six types versus 24 types even, and people struggled with the 24 types but not the six. And say whatever it is you're marketing and you think, well, if I give loads of variations, I can cater to a wider market. You might be alienating a lot of the market because now they can't make that choice. You've kind of got to make it more of a forced choice. Um, In studies, when we say, okay, is it option A, B or C? That's a forced choice. We don't say, you know, what do you think the option was? And sometimes it is better to be like that. So like you said, people don't have that option overload Maybe not like, do you want fish or beef? I would probably want a bit more information than that. Yeah. But just me. But having less options than what out of these 24 flavors would you like? Mm-hmm. Especially when it's like, if any women will, uh, women would relate to this. When you go to a nail salon <laughs> and they pull out all of those nail colors and go, what do you like? And there's like 200 there and you sit with, you know, piles of the same, almost the same red in various variations. <laughs> and you're torn between like, do I get this red or this red? <laughs> this red is sparkly. This red is slightly <laughs> pink. And you sit there for such a long time and it's this choice overload. Whereas if you're given, do you want pink, red, blue, yellow? You'll go, oh, I want red. And it's just so much easier to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about... um been in a chef pre in a previous life that when we worked for a really fancy restaurant menus often were one page mm-hmm. and the front of one page you had you had a, a meal path that you can choose and it was usually three choices in the starters three choices in the mains three yeah. choices in the desserts and that was it and and pe- people would always ask like but it's such an expensive restaurant like don't you think there should be more and i'm like but if you want the highest quality food, you, the chef yeah. can't be back there faced with having to make one of 199 things because it's impossible to prep for that big of a menu. But you give me mm-hmm. three things and you have three paths you can take. I can have all the prep ready and I can whip that stuff together in record time. And, and those restaurants, you can, like, you just knew when you walked in, that was going to be a higher quality, a higher yeah. paying, you know, higher class restaurant, but less choice. You know, so mm-hmm. it is, it is opposite of what you, like you said that you would think that maybe somebody you're paying so much more that you would get so many choices. You can have almost anything you want, but no, yeah. you're limited. Mm. So I want to take a, a slight detour on this topic. Oh no. Every time you do the hand <laughs> clap and you, 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 you fold your fingers, it's like this Dr. <laughs> Evil, like, Muhaha. you know, I just, okay. I'm nervous. So, yes. So I'm taking a slight detour still in the topic of. Uh, irrational thinking, of course. Of course. But I want to take it to the topic of embodied cognition. And I think the listeners will enjoy this. We've covered it slightly in previous topics, but it sits really well in this realm. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know what embodied cognition is, um, it's um, it sits within the realm of cognitive psychology. And it's this idea that we have an interconnection between the mind and the body how our cognition and our thinking is related to the physical body and our physical sensations. So for example, we use metaphors uh, in everyday life. Um, We say that something is going smoothly, but this interaction is going smoothly, meaning it's going well. 
or we talk about our emotions being heavy. We talk about we had, you know, a really heavy conversation and it means we had, you know, a tough conversation. And we touched on this um, lightly about how temperature- You just said it. We touched on it. <laughs> right? You just used one. <laughs> um, so we touched on this. Now I- <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, good. Yeah, sorry, because you were just describing it so perfectly. And then you're like, and then we touched on this. And you actually touched your hands as you said it. I'm like, this is a perfect, unplanned, perfect example. Yes. Um, the power of nonverbal communication, mm. which we covered in an earlier episode, for anybody interested. Um, but we spoke about how uh, we talk to other people um, and we rate them as warm or cold. Talk about, well, that person's a really warm person. They're very socially warm or they're very cold. Maybe they were very hostile. And we said that um, there is this overlap between uh, physical temperature and social temperature. So when we are physically cold, we're more likely to rate our interaction partner as cold. When we are in a warm room, we're more likely to say, oh, we had a really, you know, nice, warm conversation. And there's been loads of studies on this. And this is um, a topic that lots of people have messaged me um, for more information about. Um, and that there's loads of research that as well, after we have a really negative interaction where someone is perceived as cold, we feel more physically cold ourselves. After we have a really engaging conversation with someone we rate as warm, our body temperature goes slightly up. And you asked me a question in the early episode and said, you know, well, why do you think that is? And I said, well, I'm not entirely sure. So I've been doing a lot of digging in the realm of kind of neuroscience and social neuroscience. And there was a study done called Shared Neural Mechanisms Underlying Social Warmth and Physical Warmth. Um, and it showed that basically social warmth is built on the same basic neural mechanisms as physical warmth. So the neurological mechanisms that support how we process social interactions and social warmth overlap with those that process temperature perception and temperature regulation. And it, it's the regions are the middle insula and the ventral striatum. And in last in the last episode, we talked about the um, reward network and the reward network goes from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex to the striatum. So you'll see that there's not just an overlap in the sense of physical warmth and social warmth, but that social warmth is now overlapped with the reward processes in the brain. It's why we like to be warm. It, it feels nice. It feels more rewarding to be warm than it is to be cold. But we're also more engaging when we're warm and we find interactions more rewarding when we're warm now how does this fit into rational thinking that doesn't make any sense <laughs> why would our temperature affect how much we like somebody that isn't rational if we think that we are taking in all of the information accurately and making an accurate judgment and assessment based on a rational choice how can we be doing so if my body temperature and how cold the environment is or warm the environment is, is affecting how I perceive you socially, that's not a rational thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense just based on the idea that, like, again, we talked about this in the beginning, your mm -hmm. mood or being overtired yeah. or being hungry could affect the ability for us to think rationally and it could affect the conversation that we have. You know, I, I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm in a bad mood. I didn't get breakfast. I'm hungry. I didn't get my coffee yet. And I come in and you joke with me like yeah. you do every other day. And maybe I'm ticked off. And I'm like, what the heck? Why would she say that? And it's not because you did anything different. Yeah. I, I perceived that joke differently because of, of, of that, my, my, my background, not waking up right, not having breakfast, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. If I'm also freezing cold. I'm so thinking about myself and I'm cold and I'm irritated because I'm cold that it's going to affect my perception of, of you. That makes yeah, a lot of I'm, sense. Just on what you said about, you know, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and then maybe, you know, you're grouchy to the next person. There's a process called excitation transfer. And basically mm -hmm. when we're in an interaction that causes loads of excitation, maybe, you know, you witnessed an argument or someone shouted at you and then you go into a new interaction you can carry over that mood 
and it affects your next interaction. Mm. And that isn't rational because you're perceiving that second interaction. Say, you know, it's a very friendly conversation and you're perceiving them as attacking you because you're carrying that mood with you or carrying that excitation from the previous interaction and bringing it to this new one. Yeah, that that I, I loved when you said it. it's not rational because yeah now yeah. I'm I'm judging the next person I interact with based on my yeah. crappy conversation with the first person. Yeah, and that, that is that's unfair. Not as a not rational. It's unfair yeah. to the next person. So yeah. let, let's let's give a let's give a if we can let's give a fix. So let's say that is the case, and we know it's the case. So, you know, we all mm-hmm. we all have done that. If I'm aware, if I'm self aware, and I know I just had this terrible conversation with Joe. And now I got to have a meeting with you and I don't want to bring that irritation to that meeting. What do I do? I think, like you said, it's being self-aware. Um, if we catch ourselves acting in a way that we're like, well, why did I say that? Why am I thinking that? Or if you feel very emotional, um, there's that old saying of, you know, stop and count to 10. Hmm. And that sounds, oh, you know, what's counting to 10 going to do? Hmm. But it, what it does is it slows everything down and it gives you a chance to let that emotion flow over you and kind of disappear. Because when we're in our emotions, they feel very overwhelming. And you feel like, well, this is just how I feel. You know, I know how I feel. I know what I'm thinking. I know know, why I'm making these decisions. But actually, when you just pause, that emotion can subdue. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a second to breathe. It's like when we talk about social engineering attacks, the best thing to do when you get an email is pause and slow it down. Because emotions make us feel like we're running out of time. They make us feel like we have to act now. And we need to give ourselves a second. And our emotional center of the brain and the amygdala are activated prior to the prefrontal cortex getting involved. That prefrontal cortex is that decision-making, rational, logical part of the brain. We have to give it time to become active and now navigate our interaction rather than just driving through that emotion Um, and I mean there are some great examples that I just think are hilarious Um, there's the expression you know when you say have you ever you know something smells fishy (laughs) when you think someone's being suspicious or they're hiding something there was a study done that if you put a fishy smell in the room people are more suspicious (laughs) and that you know what sense does that make? But it only works for cultures where that metaphor holds true. Huh. So in cultures where they don't say something smells fishy, they might say, you know, it smells like there's a rat. Putting a fishy smell has not had mm-hmm. that same effect. So it is very cultural based. Um, and there's other ones like when we spoke about, um, you know, in interaction going smoothly. If you're on a bumpy car ride, having an interaction, um, Going physically smooth makes people perceive the interaction as going <laughs> more smooth. If you're on a bumpy car ride, you go, well, that was you know, a bit of a bumpy conversation. <laughs> and there's just so many examples like this. Um, like people are more determined when they flex their muscles. <laughs> like if you are flexing, you're more likely to be motivated in your work. <laughs> um, and um, Really hard to what- type. While you're flexing yes. the whole time. It's, yeah, I don't recommend it. Oh, yeah, it's really. <laughs> it's just, I mean, none of these are logical. Um, but once we understand them, we can kind of think, well, why am I making this decision? But it also, it, it gives a good influence tactic. If you are looking to understand how to influence, these might sound silly, but they're, they're studied, they're effective. If you want to create warmer conversations, Think about the temperature in the room. Think about how the room smells. Because if you go into a room and it does stink, it makes people resistant. Mm. And that isn't just um, something to be sniffed at. Um, <laughs> that's something to really take into consideration because it does have a, a studied and um, empirically supported effect. It sounds a lot um, like this would tie in really well with Dr. Goldman's research that he wrote about in the book, Emotional Intelligence on Amygdala Hijacking. Mm-hmm. And he found in his um, studies that students had a much harder time completing mathematical equations after being scared. 
and and he found that um, when yeah. he used an fMRI helmet that the amygdala the section that section of their brain that controlled that was all lit up and that frontal cortex was dark yeah. but then when he gave them a 30 second pause so he would show them a scary video then he would give them a 30 second um, yeah. neutral pause with no emotion their brains returned back to capacity to do the math again and and a quicker response time. I found that so fascinating because I was thinking about application to human security and that how this works on us is, you know, where we get an email, let's say, that really does scare us. We believe it. It's not one of those fish that's like silly. We get it. It really does scare us. Our very next decision we make is going to be based on an emotional response. No critical thinking, no, 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 uh, no frontal cortex involved in that at all. Mm -hmm. That's that explains human vulnerability so much because that is why they're always trying to use fear or humiliation or shame. That was a great podcast we did on that one that you can listen to um, shameless plug there. But, you know, that no, because you think about all these effects of these really strong negative emotions shut down our ability to critically think about the next step we should take in security. Absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest Um, effects in um, this field of rational and irrational thinking is that when we are aroused emotionally aroused we make decisions differently Mm. our emotional states they affect our decision making ability so you know don't make judgments um when you are in that state and it's not just the negative ones too Mm -hmm. when we are overwhelmed by positive emotions we make choices just because we feel good about it and a lot of the time we, we talk about, you know, trusting your gut with negative <laughs> feelings, but we do trust our gut sometimes and think, I feel really positive about this in my gut. So I'm just going <laughs> to go for it. And I can see these risks, but I've got this gut feeling uh-huh. that it feels really good. I mean, how many of us have heard this um, about relationships? You know, like people overlook these flags because they go, yeah, I've just got a gut feeling though, that he's the one or she's <laughs> the one. And you overlook these clear flags because you go with a feeling that you have. And we do it in shopping. We do it in relationships. We do it really with almost all of our interactions. Yeah. You know, it's um, when you said that, I was thinking about, I was trying to remember her name, but the, one of the women that escaped from Ted Bundy, I know it's such a terrible example, but she escaped. She, she, in, in the interview, she actually said, I, my gut was telling me to not go help him. But then I felt so bad because he had the crutches and he, he looked like he was, mm-hmm. you know, help. He was, looked like he was harmless, but her, everything inside of her brain was saying, danger, don't go to that dark car and help this guy. And she resisted that 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 warning sign that she her brain was saying run the other way and it almost cost her her life um yeah. so yeah it is amazing how we'll we'll trick ourselves into making decisions and there's absolutely no rational thought in any of that yeah there, there's so much work on how incidental emotions which are emotions that are unrelated to the target object they affect how we eat They affect how we trust people, how we support people. They affect how we procrastinate or work, what we decide to work Mm -hmm. on, how we choose products. And there's so much within that realm that it affects. But the beauty is that um, these emotions and this effect is a short-lived intensity. Mm -hmm. We let the emotion go and let it go over us. We can then go back to making a more rational choice. And there was a, a great example, um, and it's similar to an example you gave. Um, and it was a, a very old, famous study. And they had um, participants walk across a, a bridge, uh, like a dangerous bridge. It was called the suspension bridge, which created fear. And then they um, were approached on the other side of the bridge and asked someone to discuss future research. And they asked them to do uh, a task. Um, and people were more likely to be motivated to, um, oh, no, they um, got someone to ask the participant out. Um, so there was a lady on the other side of the bridge and said, you know, would you like to go out with me <laughs> for a date? And they misinterpreted the fear emotion for sexual arousal. <laughs> um, because a lot of the time we don't actually know the emotions going on in our body. We feel a physiological response and we can misinterpret what that response is. <laughs> And because of that fear, they were more likely to say, well, I'm sexually aroused to this person. So, yes, I'll do it. But it was short lived. Hmm. If they let that fear wash over them and give it a bit of time, it didn't that walking over the bridge didn't affect 
and how likely they were to say yes to going out with them. And if somebody, I would imagine if somebody wasn't afraid of heights or suspension bridges, so when they crossed, they weren't feeling fear, it probably didn't have the same effect on getting asked out. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can safely say that most people would have some fear (laughs) because it goes against everything in our biological nature to be up high looking down at a great fall, wobbly and unstable. I mean, even in adventure seekers, we still see that fear. And that's what they love. It's it's the adrenaline, it's the fear, because it's going against your body's natural desires. It's going against our entire yeah, survival. To live, yeah. <laughs> but that's why they do it. They don't do it because they're like, oh, I have no survival instinct. Uh-huh. They do it because that fear and that excitement they get for going against that instinct creates all of this excitation. Mm-hmm. So they continue doing it. So I would assume even someone who is an adrenaline junkie would still have that very similar effect because they still have that arousal effect. Well, that wasn't a very big detour. I think that fit in perfectly with the whole mm-hmm. concept of uh, of the illusion of rational thought. Yeah, is- I tried to withhold some examples. <laughs> I had so many. Um, I was thinking, well, this is a great example. This is a great example. Um, so I tried to uh, refrain and myself from giving way too many. Now, I assume like normal, we'll have a ridiculous amount of research papers listed in our show notes. I can see what you have yes. handed over here so far. So anyone who's listening that you are interested in some of these many examples that Abby didn't bring up or the research. Uh, and and I, I do this. I really grab some of these papers. You can find a lot of them online just by mm-hmm. um, going to our show notes and taking the whole name and the everything in that name and just putting it into your search engine of choice. And many times you'll find a PDF that's been put out there. Or if you have a university uh, email account, you can usually log in and get some of these, these studies. And if you're interested in this topic, uh, really near the bottom of our list, uh, Abby put about three or four uh, research papers that are all about this embodied cognition um, topic that we spoke about in the in the in the final part. They're really fascinating. Um, so I really strongly suggest you check out the show notes and look those up. And thanks always, Abby, for providing the uh, the science uh, for our our discussions. I know we get a lot of feedback on this series of our podcast, um, and people really enjoy this part that that we're that we're giving the research that we're basing our conversation on. It's a nice touch. Yeah, touch. I think um, science isn't always digestible. Because research papers are as fun as I find them to read. They aren't always so fun to read. And they take a lot of time. And a lot of them are very specialist. So just having people explain the science is just a much easier way to digest that material rather than, you know, going off and reading them all. And a lot of the time, research papers are behind a paywall as well. Mm -hmm. So even if you really want that information, you can't access that information. Fun to read. Research papers. Those two words don't ever, there's no bridge that connects them. Well, it's because there's more than two words in there, Chris. (laughs) (laughs) Those two sentences, okay, Dr. Morano, um, don't bridge together, okay? That's like negative framing, just like we talked about. You should stop doing that. (laughs) Well, I would disagree. (laughs) Thank you again for another awesome topic. I'm really, um, I'm really excited for this one to come out and see what you all think. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Abby and I, this month. And next month, we have a really interesting um, discussion. Abby and I had a really interesting discussion that led to this topic coming up, in addition to some questions that came in from, from you, the listeners. So we're going to be discussing the uh, perception, that how your perception is your reality, and what that really means and what we can learn about that on next month's the Doctor is in series. We'll see you then.